Hey everybody, welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast, where you're invited to not just attend church or watch church, or in this case, listen to church, but actually go and be the church. For everything you need to know about our community, be sure to go to newmarketalliance.ca and maybe even drop us a line to let us know you're listening. We read everything you send and we'll be sure to get back to you. Our worship service happens every Sunday at 10 a.m. in person or streaming online. We want you to know you absolutely matter to God and you absolutely matter to us. Everyone is welcome and wanted. Now, let's join today's teaching. I, uh, I saw an interesting article on the Forbes website and the uh, title really grabbed your attention. It was titled, The Top Earning Dead Celebrities of Last Year. And you'd click on that too, right? Um, On the list were names like, you know, Dr. Seuss and um, Marilyn Monroe and Whitney Houston and Prince and John Lennon, all people whose estates keep earning money. And so here are the top five for those of you who are interested. Bob Marley, $20 million. He died of cancer in 1981, had nearly a billion streams last year in the U.S. alone. And then there's the House of Marley products like um, headphones and speakers and turntables, $20 million. Number four, uh, golf legend Arnold Palmer, who died in 2016 of heart disease, but uh, brought in $30 million last year thanks to partnerships with MasterCard and Rolex, not to mention that that famous lemonade and iced tea mixed drink. Um, Number three, Charles Schultz, the creator of Snoopy and the Peanuts Gang who died in 2000 of cancer, and reruns of that comic still run in newspapers around the world, along with licensing deals for toys and companies like MetLife, 38 million last year. Number two, Elvis, uh, died in 1977 of a heart attack slash overdose uh, through annual pilgrimages to Graceland, where I have paid my respects, Uh, ongoing sales of music, Movies, licensing deals, Presley's estate brought in 39 million last year. Now, don't put it up yet. Any guesses, number one? Oh, very good. Very good. Number one, Michael Jackson died in 2009 of an overdose, even, uh, even despite recently renewed controversy over his interactions with children. The king of pop streaming surged to over $2 billion this past year. There's a Las Vegas show, a Sony deal that brought in... 60 million last year, marketing the seventh year in a row that he's topped this list. And it's amazing how people who are long gone can continue to have influence, you know, be relevant, be engaged by new generations. But let me tell you, those names are nothing compared to the most influential life that has ever been lived. And you'd be hard-pressed to find even an atheist historian who would argue against that being Jesus. But you would have never seen that coming based on his life. Um, So let's get the first thing off the table. It seems almost too obvious to mention, but for those who perhaps haven't done the research, you need to know there was someone named Jesus of Nazareth who walked the earth 2,000 years ago. There's no scholar, no matter where they stand on Christianity itself, that would deny that, uh, that there was a man named Jesus, the one the Bible talks about, that he existed in time and history. It's, it's just not in dispute, okay? There is more extra biblical evidence, that's, that's sources other than the Bible, uh, that confirm the life of Jesus then there is evidence of, you know, the, uh, the Battle of Waterloo and Napoleon, something that, you know, that we just take as fact. So we have to at least start with that truth, okay? Here's what we know. We know Jesus was born in a small, obscure village of, of somewhat questionable repute. He's the child of a peasant woman. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He never wrote a book. He never held public office, and he was only 33 or so when the the tide of public consensus kind of turned against him, prompting even his, his closest friends to abandon him. 
And, and he was then turned over to his enemies and he was nailed to a wooden cross between two criminals. And while he was dying, his executioners, they gambled for his clothing, uh, the only property that he had on earth. And after he died, he was laid in a borrowed grave that was donated through the pity of an acquaintance. Yet today, he is the central figure of the entire human race. Uh, his life even marks our concept of time. We call, we call this 2021 AD, Latin for Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Anything before that we call BC, meaning before Christ. And even if you're, you know, get super politically correct and remove the Christian overtones and, we, and call it the common era, CE or BCE, before common era, it still is the life of Jesus that marks that divide. Now, obviously, the most detailed record of his life is found in the Bible. And that, um, that gives not one, but, but four independent eyewitness accounts, biographical accounts written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. More than a few historians have noted that Jesus is the most documented life and cut. Here we go. Here comes Glenn. He knows what to do. Oh, good. Uh-oh. Oh, you're missing a leg. Oh, leg is missing. You know what? I was just going to play... Um... No, just stand here. Though. Yeah. Was <laughs> oh, that really what's going to happen? Uh, oh, it's taped. Folks, you really need to give your tithes and offerings because... <laughs> Um, it, it's not totally necessary. I, I was just going to play a game of Pictionary halfway through the, the sermon. Uh, okay, beautiful. Um, you know, we know his teachings. Uh, we, we have, in, even in modern era, he's part of our cultural ethos. You know, whether it was lines like, do unto others as they would do unto you. Uh, timeless stories like the prodigal son. No one has been more spiritually or culturally influential. And we know that miracles were attributed to him. Now, whether or not you believe in the possibility of miracles, people who witnessed his life certainly did, and they recorded them. And we know that after a public ministry, he was sentenced to death by, by a Jewish court and then a Roman legal process. We know that on the third day after his execution, there was an empty tomb. Uh, no one denies that. A stone was rolled away and the body was gone. Even the, the Roman guards guarding owned that. And we know his followers went running around the area saying that Jesus had risen from the dead and that they had seen him and that they had touched him. And this wasn't just like one or a couple of his disciples. This was all of them. There was even records of groups numbering in the hundreds who witnessed this resurrected Jesus at the same time. And then things got really crazy after that. That first Easter, the Jesus movement exploded. By AD 100, there were around 25,000 followers. By AD 310, there were about 20 million. And today there are billions of Jesus followers and it's the world's largest religious faith. And it's no wonder that when it comes to Jesus, we have lots of questions that we want answered. In fact, a couple years ago at James Emery White's church, he's uh, the author of this book that we are highlighting Christianity for those who aren't Christians. Or um, He asked a kind of a congregational survey of what their top questions were about Jesus. And I'm going to assume that some of these might be your questions too. You know what the top one was? What did Jesus look like? Um, do we even know what he looked like? Well, in typical Jonathan fashion, the answer is yes and no. Um, so first the no part. And, and I think this is important. The Bible never says that Jesus was white, six foot three, blonde hair, chiseled good looks. But here's the yes part. We do know 
that he wasn't white, six foot three, with blonde hair and chiseled good looks. Now, there is not a single historical reference to the physical appearance of Jesus. Uh, We do know that he was a Mediterranean Jew. Therefore, his skin would have been, um, you know, that all of darkness, which you find in the region to this day. It also means he didn't speak English. Not even the King James English. No, there was no thee or thou. Uh, His native tongue was Aramaic. He would have been schooled as a boy in in Hebrew and probably Greek, which was the common language of, of commerce. But when walking down the road with his family, Aramaic was the language of choice. And being a a Mediterranean Jew of that day also meant that he wasn't overly tall, definitely under six foot. And according to the ancient prophecies surrounding the coming of the Messiah, he wasn't physically impressive at all. In fact, this is the, the words of the prophet Isaiah who wrote, of Jesus. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So the idea that Jesus was, you know, tall, dark, and handsome is only accurate in the fact that he was dark. And the earliest drawings that were ever made of him, at least in the, um, you know, that are still in existence, date back to the fifth century. You may, you may recognize this picture. It, it hangs in in one of the most ancient structures on earth in St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Desert of, of Egypt. It's the classic uh, picture of Jesus that dominated ancient Christianity, continues to um, uh, be displayed in many churches to this day. Um, and while ancient, we don't know if this is what Jesus really looked like. So a few years ago, there was some forensic anthropologists and they tried to recreate what Jesus might have actually looked like based on common skeletal remains of that era and that region. And the image they came up with is not meant to be flattering so much as it's meant to be accurate for that time. And this is what they, they came up with. And then there's the, the hotly debated Shroud of Turin. It's, it's authentic its authenticity is, is really in question. It's thought by some to be the linen that the body of Jesus was wrapped in following his crucifixion and that it miraculously carries his image to this day. And here's what that looks like. But in truth, we do not know. We do not know what he actually looked like beyond most certainly being short, dark skinned, not exactly Ryan Gosling esque. Okay. But here's what we do know about him, and and it's the most important thing to know about him. We know who he said he was, okay? You can imagine that the air around Jesus at this time would have been electric. There was miraculous feedings of thousands of people, healings of all kinds of diseases, even people who were raised from the dead. And, And people want to know who he was, and in no uncertain terms, Jesus told them. Let me read you just one of those very direct declarations. The Jews said to Jesus, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? I am not demon possessed. I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I tell you the truth. If a man keeps my word, he will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, now we know that you're demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. You say that if a man keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to kill him. Who did Jesus say he was? This is extremely important to unpack, and and I want to write it down. He referred to himself as, I am. Now, that could just uh, be bad grammar or, um, you know, 
maybe he was trying to say something significant. He most certainly was. It was significant. The background of I am is found in one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament, the story of Moses and this burning bush where God himself is, is telling Moses to go to the highest authority in, in the land and demand that he release the slaves. And Moses is like, well, when I go to the Israelites and say, you know, get ready to leave this land behind, and they ask me, under whose authority, who shall I say is calling? Okay? He, he's asking for the name of God. And here's the answer that God gave to him. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say. I am has sent me to you. So this phrase, I am, is considered by some the most holy word in in existence because it is the very name of God. It it was considered so holy that the Jews wouldn't even um, write it out completely. They would only pen uh, the four consonants. Um, It would look like this. How would you pronounce that? Yeah. And uh, scholars used to think it was pronounced uh, Jehovah, Jehovah. Uh, And we can now know that the closest that we can make of the actual name in light of the missing vowels is is pronounced Yahweh. So it would look a little like, like this. God said, my name is Yahweh. I am. Now, back to what Jesus said when he was asked about his identity. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus claimed the very name of the living God for himself. He said, you want to know who I am? I'll tell you, I am God. And even if we don't get all the implications of what he said, rest assured the people listening to him sure did because They were ready to kill him. They thought he was nothing short of blasphemous. So here was a man claiming to be God himself. But guess what? It was a claim he repeatedly made throughout his life. Here's just a taste from some of the biographical records. Um, I am the son of God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? I am said Jesus. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, let me just talk quickly about some of that father-son language there, because some of you may be puzzled by it or have always wondered about it. If Jesus is God in human form, um, why did he call himself the Son of God? And why did he pray to his Father, God? That doesn't make sense. Why Why did God pray to God if he was God? Who was he praying to? First, it it helps to be clear that um, that it, it is that Jesus was claiming to be God, but he always claimed to be God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. Now, I've just lost some people with this, but please hang with me for a second because this is really important. One of the most amazing teachings in the Bible is about God and the idea that God is is triune, okay? That his very nature is trinity, three in one. The Bible teaches the oneness of God. There are not many gods. There is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Um, Little Jewish boys and little Jewish girls would say that every day as they do to this day, but but Then the Bible follows that up with another teaching. There are three persons who are each referred to as God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, these are not three gods, but three persons who are one God. So you find Jesus referring to to God the Father, but then referring to himself as God as well, but he was God the Son. To be the son of someone in that way that Jesus was referring to is to be of the same nature, to have the same qualities of that person. 
look, I know the Trinity is going to make your brain hurt. Um, but hopefully that doesn't disturb you because don't you think there should be some brain hurting things when it comes to God? Like he ought to be bigger than what we can kind of wrap our heads around or else he's no bigger than our intellect. The Trinity at its heart means that God is community. The perfect relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think it's, it's the, the reason that we long for intimacy with each other because we are made in the image of perfect intimacy. So, so that's why you have Jesus, God the Son, praying, talking, communicating with God the Father. Jesus was God. And listen, no other major religious figure in all of history made that claim. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Confucius. Only Jesus made the claim to be God in human form. So what are we supposed to do with that information? How are we supposed to respond? Well, there are really only four options. And first, you could conclude that Jesus was like, you know, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He was a stark, raving lunatic. Maybe he did think he was God, but so do lots of insane people. The problem is, there's nothing in the historical record of the life of Jesus that exhibits even a single sign of any of the classical manifestations of of mental illness. In fact, there was a psychiatrist, J.T. Fisher, who concluded that if you were to survey all of the data that the field of psychiatry has to offer and boil it down to one essential and perfect prescription for mental health, he said it would be the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous message that Jesus ever proclaimed. Okay, maybe he wasn't crazy. Maybe he's just a liar. Jesus said he was God, but obviously he was deceiving people, right? So the the man who's teaching has set the standard for integrity and honesty throughout the civilized world, was a habitual, premeditated, pathological liar even more important to remember is that Jesus was arrested, mocked, beaten, tortured prior to his execution, willingly. Listen, Jesus was offered a full pardon by the Roman governor Pilate if he would simply deny his claim to be God. You know, if a con man could stop a nail being driven into his hand, Uh, By telling the truth, you think he would. People who are who are playing the system for personal gain, they tend to change the game when it stops paying off. They keep they keep up the lie until the deception costs more than what they gain from the deceit. But Jesus endured it all. He never denied the claim to be God, even though he was given every chance. A third option, one I suspect that a lot of people side with, you saw it on that video, is to say that Jesus was a good man, maybe even a prophet from God, but that's all. Not people, uh, most people don't want to say he was a a cuckoo crazy or that he was an outright liar. There really isn't evidence for any of those conclusions but they can't quite bring themselves to say that he was God in human flesh either. So they land on him being simply a good man, a holy man, but nothing more. Okay. But there's a, there's a problem with this option. And C.S. Lewis is, is, is the guy who articulated this dilemma the best. And it, some of you may remember the, the lunatic liar, Lord or good man uh, conundrum. Lewis was a lot more than just the guy who wrote Narnia, by the way. He was a brilliant intellect who journeyed himself from atheism to Christianity. And he wrote about how intellectually dishonest it is to call Jesus just a good man. Let me read you his words. 
He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept him as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And Lewis was right. Here, here he, he paints a picture of a man who walked the earth, claimed to be God in human form. That's not a neutral proposition, okay? I'd have more respect for you if you just say that Jesus was insane. I'd have more respect for you if you just said that he was outright lying. But to try to have it both ways and say, oh, he's a good man. He's a, he's a good teacher, but not God. It's, that's ridiculous. A good man wouldn't say that about himself unless it were true. Of course, the last of our four options is that you can fall at, your, at his feet, call him Lord. Call him Savior. Call him God. It's the conclusion I came to. You'll need to come to your own, I suppose. I know, um, I know you want proof. Prove that Jesus was really God. People certainly said that directly to Jesus. And, and the eyewitness accounts record that he did prove it throughout this stunning array of, of miracles from walking on water to raising the dead, Jesus silenced more than his fair share of skeptics. But he raised the stakes even further. He laid out a very specific proof for his claims that he invited everyone to judge him by. And honestly, the entire world is still talking about it. His big proof? Coming back to life after dying. It's what he would call the the Jonah test or the sign of Jonah. It was patterned after the story of Jonah being in the belly of a whale for three days and then emerging after that. And he said, I'm going to die. But in three days after that, I'm going to come back to life and I will give you that sign so that you will know that everything I've told you is true. I am who I said I am. And he told people all along that's what he was going to do. And and they didn't always understand it. His disciples didn't get it. But it would be the definitive validation that he was who he said he was. So for time's sake, we can't read all the times that Jesus spoke of this. But let me read just one from Luke. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus said, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans, and he will be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and kill him, but on the third day, he will rise again. Over and over, Jesus made those claims. It was the test by which you could judge his divinity. Uh, Whether he would come back from the dead on the third day, like he said he would, And so everything hinges on this resurrection prediction. Even the Bible says it's everything. One of the the leaders of the early church, Paul, wrote this. He says, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. Everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits we passed on to you, verifying that God raised up Christ, sheer fabrications if there's no resurrection. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up. So what would happen 
if you really looked at the resurrection of Jesus with all the academic and historical and intellectual rigor that's possible, uh, what would you discover if you had the resources and the time to do skeptical detective work into the claims of the resurrection? One of the more fascinating accounts of digging into this case, if you will, was conducted by this guy, J. Warner Wallace, and he was a decorated homicide detective, of all things. He was trained through the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. He worked on the SWAT team and investigated homicide cases. And he was a founding member of the department's cold case unit, where they were assigned to crack murders that nobody else had been able to solve. And he was, you know, a natural street smart skeptic. He said, uh, as a cop, if you believe everything people tell you, then you're never going to arrest anyone. And so for him, facts needed to be solid. Witnesses have to be credible. Evidence must be persuasive. Corroboration is crucial. Alibis have to be dismantled. And, and he's very, very good at what he does. Wallace was awarded the, the Police Medal of Valor in sustained superiority and uh, at, the, at the Cops West Award for his ability to get to the truth and solve crimes. He's so good. He's been, he's been featured <clears throat> multiple times on Court TV, uh, NBC's Dateline, and other news outlets when they need expertise on what it takes to arrest killers who, who thought they had gotten away with murder. Let me, let me just show you just a real clip so you get a sense of this guy. There's no statute of limitations on murder, and the ones that are unsolved go into a cold case file. In Torrance, California, those cases landed on the desk of Detective Jim Warner Wallace. Several cold cases that Jim solved were featured on NBC Dateline. In the end, you're trying to figure out what just happened here, constantly entering each scene and asking what really happened here, using the evidence available to you. Because these are cases that really were were given up for loss. They they, they really nobody had any expectations and never saw in those cases. Jim started in law enforcement as a patrol officer. A second generation cop, he wore his badge proudly. He had a keen eye and sharp mind, and by his 30s, was promoted to detective. So <clears throat> get a load of this. Wallace decides to take on the coldest case of his life, one that goes back not a few years, but a few thousand years. He took on the death and resurrection of Jesus. He was an atheist. He didn't believe a resurrection had actually happened, but wanted to figure out what did happen since his wife had started to dabble a bit in Christianity and, and he was not real happy about that. And so He frankly wanted to debunk the resurrection of Jesus. And he spent six months of painstaking analysis, employing everything that he had been taught uh, and had mastered as a detective, such as resisting the influence of dangerous presuppositions, the importance of uh, abductive reasoning, respecting the nature of circumstantial evidence, evaluating the reliability of witnesses, examining the choice and meaning of language through forensic statement analysis, determining what's important evidentially, uh, recognizing the rarity of true conspiracies, establishing reliability by tracing the evidence. He looked at every possible alternative there was to an actual resurrection. Could the disciples have stolen the body? Uh, Could the Jewish or Roman authorities have stolen the body? Uh, On that first Easter morning, could people just have went to the wrong tomb? He even dug into whether or not Jesus had actually literally died on the cross. And at the end of his investigation, this cold case specialist reached this conclusion. Christianity is true beyond reasonable doubt. The the resurrection must have happened. And today, Detective J. Warner Wallace is a deeply devout follower of Jesus. This is what he had to say when interviewed about his new faith. God knew me. He knew how committed I was to looking at evidence. 
And I think God reached me through that evidence. It may not be how everyone hears the gospel for the first time. But for folks like me, I needed to be reached this way. So I'm only a Christian today because it's true. So for the skeptic and the scientists out there saying, time out. Dead people don't rise. You know what? You're right. You're right. We know that. And they knew it then. But that's the point. This is what startled theologian N.T. Wright, who, who taught at both Cambridge and Oxford. And he writes that no one would have thought up the resurrection because nobody believed that that possibility existed. He wrote, the early Christians did not invent the empty tomb and the meetings or sightings of the risen Jesus in order to explain a faith they already had. They developed that faith because of what they saw, because of what they experienced, because what they didn't think was going to happen or could happen did. Now, what you do with all of this, and believe me, I've, <laughs> I've tried to compress this as much as I could, but it's, it's up to you. But make no mistake, this is what Christianity rests on, okay? It's about Jesus, full stop. He is the basis of which you will accept or reject it. And specifically, who you say Jesus is. That's at the heart of it. You, you want to explore the Christian faith? You want to get at this, this question? You've got to wrestle with it. Who Jesus is really is. Is he who he said he was? And that's it. That's the big one. It's not a question that you can just sort of shrug your shoulders at. It's, it's something you just can't be neutral about. You can reject it. You can be in the process maybe of careful evaluation as you weigh the evidence. I'd love it if you'd accept it. But you can't just shrug your shoulders and walk away indifferently about it. You can be a lot of things about Jesus, but indifferent isn't one of them. Because if he was who he said he was, all bets are off. Uh, your world just got rocked. And all of a sudden you have a, an eternity facing you that you've got to figure out. 